Morning, church family. Glad that you joined us on this Palm Sunday as we celebrate what God has done for us on the cross of Calvary. And that song, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, this morning as we go into our message, we're continuing our series that we'll finish up next week on This Changes Everything. We've looked at how grace changed things. We looked at how faith has changed things. Love has changed things. We've seen how the resurrection changed everything for the life of Peter. We've seen how it changed everything for Nicodemus. And this morning, I want us to go to the place of the crucifixion. We're going to be in Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23, as we look at the death of Jesus as he's hanging on the cross. If you remember, he was betrayed on uh, that Thursday night late after the Passover meal, and he went uh, to the garden with his disciples to pray, and that's when Judas came to him. During that time frame of going through trials and everything, that's when uh, Peter had his encounter with uh, the servant girl and he denied knowing Jesus that's when their eyes met and he went outside the city and wept bitterly and then Jesus has been led before uh, Pontius Pilate he's been taken to Herod he's seen the high priest he's already been slapped he's already been stripped of his clothing they uh, beat him with a cat and nine tails so his back is broken his body is bleeding profusely. They put a purple robe on him. They put a crown of thorns. And they were saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They were mocking him. They were beating on him. They were spitting on him. And if that wasn't enough, they took him out, led him through the streets of the city, and took him up to a hill called Golgotha, which is known as the Place of the Skull. And from all uh, records and accounts, you can see that it looks like a s actual skull uh, from uh, the pictures. And that's where Jesus was crucified. And the scripture tells us that he was crucified in the center. And on either side were two thieves. And that's where we're picking up our story today. Because I want you to see that the resurrection, and this will tie in perfectly with next week as we meet all together uh, for our wonderful Easter service, that because of the resurrection, it changed everything for one of these thieves on the cross. We pick up in verse 32 of Luke chapter 23. It says, two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. I love this story because even in the midst of such immense pain, in the midst of so much sorrow and heartbreak, 
Jesus stopped, took time, and entered into a relationship with someone. We don't have much background on these men. We don't know exactly what all the crimes were that they had committed. We don't even know if they had ever met Jesus or even not. Surely the word had already spread so far that they had heard about who Jesus is, but whether or not they ever had any encounter with him before this day and time, we just don't know. But here, something clicked in the mind of one of the thieves. The other is sitting there, he's just going off and uh, lamb blasting him and telling him how worthless he is and uh, save us and save yourself too. But something clicked in the heart and the mind of the other thief. And he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He also said, we're getting what we owe. This is justice for us. But notice what he said. He said, but this man has done nothing wrong. So what was it that clicked for this criminal on a cross who is at the end of his life, there is no hope. Later in scripture you see in the same section, you see that because the next day was the preparation day for the Sabbath, that they went in and broke the criminal's legs so that they couldn't push up to get air and so that they would suffocate quicker and be dead so that they could take them off of the cross. And so they're hours from death. What changed for this man? The same thing that changes for you and for me. No one can come to God unless the Holy Spirit pulls him to him. Something had to have happened that he knew some of the stories about Jesus. You and I have heard the stories about Jesus. We've heard that he healed the lame. We've heard that he uh, raised Lazarus from the dead. He raised a, a sick girl. There's another story where they're passing by and a uh, procession came by with a dead body and he just reached over and uh, brought the child back to life. We know of him uh, healing the sick, healing the blind, healing the deaf, healing the mute, uh, walking on water, feeding the 5,000, feeding the 4,000, uh, casting out demons. We've heard these stories and some of us can recite them almost word for word. But what is it about just hearing it to knowing it? The thief evidently had heard the stories, but he didn't know the one behind it. How many times have you and I heard the stories but we forget who is behind it. How many times have we told the story, but we don't know the story? I always loved uh, listening growing up, especially during the summer when I was out of school and I'd be doing stuff with my dad and helping him and he'd have the radio on and would be listening to it and about the same time every day, you'd get uh, Paul Harvey, and he would tell a, a really nice story, and that's about it. But then later in the day, you get Paul Harvey's The Rest of the Story, and you find out something about someone that you had no clue about. Well, that's kind of like what this man did. He had known the story, but he didn't know the full story. And so on this day, hanging on a cross, 
next to Jesus. He learned the rest of the story. I mean, the comments that are right before this that Jesus makes is he's just been nailed to the cross. He's just been raised up. People are making fun of him. They're coming by shaking their head. They're cursing at him. They're laughing at him. They're mocking him. And what does Jesus say? The Son of God, God himself in flesh, who could have just easily said, die, 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 to every person that walked by and made fun of him, and they dropped dead right there. But what does he say? Father, forgive them. Even on the cross, Jesus showed you and me mercy and forgiveness. I've said it before, it wasn't the Romans, it wasn't the Jews that held him there. It was his love for you and for me that kept him on the cross. The same God that all he did was speak the word and everything that there is came into existence. It wasn't nails that kept him on the cross. It was his love and his care and his burden for our salvation. That's what kept him there. And he looked out and he said, Father, forgive them. I wonder how many other thousands of people that had been crucified by the Romans either before or after this had something like that that was so powerful that they would say, forgive them for what they're doing to me. Something happened so incredible at the cross that in Matthew's version when... Uh, Jesus breathed his last. The, a Roman centurion that was at the foot of the cross said, surely this man was the Son of God. Some uh, historians believe that that was the same centurion that was in the garden that Peter cut his ear off. Uh, we don't know any way to prove or disprove that, but... Just seeing the events unfold there was enough for him to believe. Just being in the presence of Jesus hanging on a cross and seeing him and having all of those thoughts go back through this criminal's mind was enough for him to say, you know, we'd, we'd get what we deserve, but he is innocent. We deserve our death. He doesn't. That's why Paul tells us in Galatians that he who became, who knew no sin, Jesus Christ, became sin for us so that we could be forgiven. That's what part of the cross was all about, was to forgive us and pay our penalty for sin. But there was something else that this criminal did on the cross you and I can go through life and we can ask for forgiveness for anything and everything that we can think of. You know, when I was little, I had a pack of uh, uh, different collectible books and I had one book that had some baseball cards in it. And I wanted some and my mom wouldn't buy them for me at the grocery store, so what did I do? Like any good honest kid, I picked it up and put it in my pocket. And I hid the, the evidence of the wrappers and made sure I put it in there. And it was one of the few times I volunteered to take out the trash growing up. So that way I knew that it was out in the alley and nobody would know. But I felt really bad that I had stolen a package of baseball cards just so it could go in uh, my book. 
that wasn't anything major in the grand scheme of things, but because it's stealing, the Ten Commandments say that thou shalt not steal. I stole because I didn't pay for it. Therefore, by the law, it says that I must be put to death because I stole. Because I stole, I have broken God's law. Because I broke God's law, I'm no longer innocent. There has to be punishment. Just because of that one little thing, I no longer deserved and I no longer earned God's love. I want you to hear that again. Because I messed up one time, I no longer deserve, nor did I earn God's love. And I know we always say that uh, we don't uh, earn our salvation. And you're right, we can't because we broke our relationship with him the first time that we sinned. So we can't earn that back. Because if you earn something, you can lose it again. We earn privileges. We earn our uh, paychecks. But what happens if you don't do a good job? You don't get a paycheck. You and I can't always do good. We're going to mess up. First time we mess up, we don't deserve that anymore, so we're out again. That's why we can't earn our salvation. Because then we'd have to always earn it and we'd always be losing it. He messed up. You and I have messed up. Scripture is clear. If we break one commandment, we're guilty of breaking them all. So... We have messed up. We're like this criminal. We have deserved our punishment of being on a cross, of dying because of our sin. The best that we can hope for is that somebody will remember us. You know, when we have a funeral, we always remember the good things about someone. And we hope that when it's our time to go, that there will be somebody that can say something nice about us after we're gone. But as good as it is to have somebody say something nice here, wouldn't it be even better if somebody remembered us in heaven? That's what it sounds like he is saying here. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Because unlike the disciples, he realized this is over. There is no kingdom here on earth that you're coming to. You're dying just like me. So there has to be a kingdom somewhere else. But this is where the rest of that story comes in. Because the story ends with him saying, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Whenever you're there, just remember me, please. But Jesus goes a step farther. Remember what he said? Here in verse 42, 43. And he said to him, truly I say to you today. I'm not just saying this that uh, to you today. I'm saying that today this is going to happen to you. You will be with me in paradise. Because it wasn't just simple, simply a remember me. The criminal was saying, you are who you say you are. 
I'm guilty. I deserve this. You don't. You are innocent. You are pure. You are holy. You are who you say you are. Remember me. And Jesus says, without coming right out and saying it, he's saying the same thing that he said multiple times to other people that he's touched. The same thing that he says to you and to me. Today, your sins are forgiven. And he tells him, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, paradise is not some purgatory that we go to when we die so that somebody can pray us out or hopefully we've done enough good things to make it into heaven. Paradise is simply a place that all believers go to once they have accepted Christ after they die. Well, when they accept Christ or saved, when we die, let me clarify that, when we die, then we go to paradise. It's also referred to in Scripture as Abraham's bosom. It's a place that we're at with God. And we'll be there until Christ comes back and conquers death and hell and Satan forever and ever. And then we will uh, have a new heaven and a new earth come down that we will rule and reign with Jesus for all eternity. But that's only because we have put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. We have called on him as this criminal did and say, you are the son of God. You are the righteous one. So let me ask you, this Palm Sunday, as we remember what took place on this day, this is the same day, six days prior to this story. This is when Jesus rode in to the city of Jerusalem on the back of a colt that had never been ridden before. And as he's coming in as a humble king, as what was described in Scripture, he comes in and he's riding. Behold, your king comes to you on the back of a colt. And the people saw this and they came out and brought palm branches. That's where we get Palm Sunday from. And they laid them down in the streets and they laid uh, bl uh, blankets and coats down in the street for him to uh, go across. And they shouted out, Hosanna, hail king of the Jews. And it was a celebratory service. But how fickle that the whole town turned on Jesus. You don't hear in worship at the foot of the cross, hail king of the Jews, you hear it in a mockery tone. But from one of the three crosses, you hear you are the king. Remember me. So my question to you this morning is are you waving your branches saying hail king of the Jews, hail king of my life, my heart, my all or are we looking at the cross and mocking saying you saved others and you can't even save yourself. Here's the great thing that we see about this story. And I think it's one of the reasons why it's included in Scripture. This man is at the end of his life. He doesn't have years to live. 
It's not one of these deals when if he comes to Jesus, that Jesus is going to restore him and heal him and send him on his way and he can tell others about what he's done. Jesus, if he forgives him, then that's the end of the story because he's going to be dead in hours. And then he's going to be put in a grave and that's the last that we talk about him. But there was something different that took place. It doesn't matter what he did to get him on the cross. All we know is that he had sinned and broken the law. It doesn't matter what you and I have done that gets us into a sinful place. We just know that we have sinned which means we have broken God's law, which means we have a death sentence that is now put upon us. And for justice to be served, we must die. So what do we do? There is zero hope for us. But that's where the story comes in. Just as he called out to Jesus in his time of need, we can call on Jesus in our time of need. Even though he was a sinner, even though he had broken God's law, Jesus forgave him. even though you and I have broken God's law. And we've turned our back on him so many times. He still forgives us. Every single time that we call upon him. It's amazing that he would do that. But that's why it's called grace. I'm sure you've heard the acrostic for grace that it's we hear a lot of times people say that it's God's unmerited favor towards us or it's what uh, we receive in, uh, from God instead of what we deserve. Those are all true, but the acrostic that I love stands for God's riches at Christ's uh, expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. Because we receive everything that God has. A new name. A promise of a new body. A place to dwell. A family of love. A new life. A new identity. Forgiveness of our sins. And it didn't cost us a dime. Which is a good thing, because for some of us, we don't have a dime to give up. All it does is it requires us to say, I no longer am boss. I am no longer the master of my life. Please. Remember me. And just like Jesus did for the man on the cross, he will do for you and for me when we come to him. And say, you will be in paradise with me. Now isn't that worth celebrating this Palm Sunday, that we can have forgiveness of our sin, no matter what it is, whether it's something great or something small, that's all equal in God's eyes. It's still breaking what he has asked us to do. Yet he still forgives us. He still loves us. He still wants us. The, this is a man who is condemned to die and is hanging on a cross. According to the Jewish law, 
This man could never, ever be spoken of again because the scripture says, cursed is anyone who hangs on a cross. That's why from this time forward, the Jews never spoke of Jesus. It was the way or the one because you couldn't mention his name anymore. You didn't talk about them favorably. And what do we see here? It was put in scripture so that we could see that Jesus still cared about this man. Whatever you have done today, yesterday, in your past, or whatever you will do in the future, God still cares about you. He hasn't forgotten you. He's not even mad at you. He loves you. And he wants to be able to use you to do something mighty and amazing for him. This man on the cross had nothing left. His life was almost over. But he was able to accept Christ, receive his mercy, receive his forgiveness, and enter into paradise. You and I still have life in our lungs. While we may not know what tomorrow holds, we may not know what tomorrow brings or even the rest of today. That doesn't change the fact that we can still come to him. But it also gives us hope and should give us some excitement that when we come to him, we now have time to go and live a right life. You want your marriage to be better? You want your home to be better? You want your life to be better? You, your job, your school, wherever you are, if you want it to be better, I can give you the best 100% surefire plan to make sure that your everything is so much better. Make sure that Jesus is Lord of your life. When you've accepted him as your savior, he makes everything better. And this encounter on the cross between Jesus and this criminal changed everything for this man. Not because of what Jesus did right then. That was part of it. But if Jesus would have stayed dead, that Easter Sunday morning. If the women went to the tomb with that 75 pounds of spices that they had prepared and they opened up the grave and they went in to anoint the body and the body would have still been there and the body would still be there today, I can guarantee you there had been no hope for this man. There had been no hope for Peter. There had been no hope for Nicodemus. And as we'll see next week, there would be no hope for you and me. It's only because of the resurrection that this changed everything. So again, my question to you is, have you allowed the love and forgiveness and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ to change everything for you? If not, there's no better reason to wait. Just do it today. If you have, then let's live like he really has saved us. Let's go to God in prayer. God, we thank you that even in our darkest hours, even in the pits of our most deepest despair, when all hope seems lost, you still meet us there. You still love us, and you forgive us. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your shed blood on Calvary 
and an empty tomb in the garden so that we could have a home, a hope, and a future with you. In your name we pray. Amen. Love you. Can't wait to see you next Sunday in person here at the church, 2 p.m. It will be an exciting service as we celebrate what Jesus has done. We'll see you next week. Love you. Bye.